with the, the ancient Greeks and the Eleusinian mysteries that they knew how to take a goth and treat it in such a way to make it into a kind of LSD like potion. You could, you could do some crude chemistry, for example, if you take wood ashes and leach them with water, you'll get potassium hydroxide. So con conceivably, maybe there were, they had a technique for doing a partial hydrolysis, taking wood ashes, leaching out the water, then treating ergot alkaloids and getting a partial hydrolysis. And then you can neutralize that back with um, acetic acid, old, old wine that you've gone bad. You, you could do some basic chemistry like that. Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is David Nichols. David is a legendary psychopharmacologist and world-renowned expert in psychedelics. His research career began in 1969, and he was professor at Purdue University until his retirement in 2012. Today, we discuss the psychopharmacology of substances like LSD, psilocybin, MDMA, and DMT. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with David Nichols. David, thanks for coming on the podcast. Happy to be here. So you've had a very long running and illustrious career in uh, psychopharmacology. Maybe we could begin with how you came to work in the area of psychedelics in particular. Um, I got interested when I was an undergraduate. Um, my, after I graduated from high school, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> um, my parents didn't have enough money to send me away to school, but went to University of Kentucky. And LSD and marijuana were hitting the University of Kentucky. And they come back on weekends and uh, they talk about smoking marijuana and taking acid and, and so forth. And I go, you guys are crazy. You're going to get addicted. This is nasty stuff. And they laughed at me. So I went over to Cincinnati and I bought a used book in pharmacology, Solman's Manual of Pharmacology. And I started reading about marijuana and uh, they had just a little bit about LSD, but it sounded like it's fairly benign substance. And I thought, where, where have I been getting all this information about how bad it was? And it was after kind of about the time Nixon was starting his drug war. So uh, I got interested in, in learning more about them and uh, read some more. And I thought, well, these sound like really interesting molecules. So um, after I graduated with my bachelor's degree, I had applied to graduate schools and uh, was looking for a place doing research on what they were called psychotomimetics back then. And I couldn't find any place in the United States anyway that was doing that kind of research. And um, I found a fellow at the University of Iowa named Joe Cannon, who had been working on atropine type compounds, which very are, are very disruptive of consciousness. So I applied there and, and some other schools, but I applied to Iowa with the idea that maybe I would go, that was as close as I could get to psychoactive compounds. So I got in, uh, Dr. Cannon applied for an NDEA fellowship for me, and uh, I ended up going to University of Iowa uh, against the advice of all the people I was working with because it was a small college and nobody knew anything about it. And I um, might've been accepted at Ohio State in organic chemistry. And they said, oh, you know, you have to go to Ohio State. But, I really was interested in studying how drugs work, and Ohio State was just a chemistry PhD. So I got to Iowa, and I met with Joe Cannon, and uh, I was expecting him to tell me about his project on atropine analogs, and instead he said he was working on drugs called uh, apomorphines, apomorphine analogs. And apomorphine, if you take morphine and dissolve it in... Uh, basically six normal hydrochloric acid heated up and undergoes a number of rearrangements and you get a compound called apomorphine, which is not a narcotic anymore, but if you take it, it causes severe vomiting. And my guess was that <clears throat> his work was funded by the Defense Department and they had the idea that if you made a really potent apomorphine analog, you could spray it over the enemy troops and they would all be vomiting and they wouldn't be able to fight. Wow. But <clears throat> all the literature that he gave me and uh, that I saw as relevant was all printed in German journals. I had to take a reading German for my undergraduate degree in chemistry, but I didn't enjoy, chem didn't enjoy German and uh, didn't look forward to doing a lot of research in, in Germany. 
German German literature. So that was kind of frustrating. And also, he didn't understand really my background. I had started off in chemical engineering, and after two years, um, I just couldn't handle the math background in my high school in Kentucky was really poor. And I found, and I was doing well in everything except for the advanced math classes. So I decided to drop out and get a chemistry degree, work for a while, and go back and, and get a chemistry degree. <clears throat> So I was working as a laboratory technician for actually about five and a half years in the greater Cincinnati area and going to night school four nights a week from 6.15 to 10.15, Monday through Thursday. And weekends are always spent with uh, doing homework and all the things I should have been doing. Then I had a, a baby boy that was born in 1967 while I was still in school. So um, going back to school didn't look like it was going to be um, something that was going to be feasible. So uh, when I finished my night school degree and had the opportunity to go to graduate school, and that was with a fellowship. So I thought, okay, let's check this out. <clears throat> so I got to Iowa and I talked to Joe Cannon and he gave me this project with a porphines and, and, and suggested that I could wrap this project in record time and get back out and start making money again to take care of my family. But I had been burning the candle at both ends for the previous five and a half years, and it wasn't really a goal of mine to get out quickly and get back to work. So I was looking forward to just having um, a graduate career, which was relatively simple compared with what I'd been doing. Um, and as a graduate student, I just had to take a couple of courses in chemistry and advanced chemistry, and the rest of my time was in the lab. So that was going to be a vacation for me, really, whereas most people, you know, they come out of undergraduate, they go to graduate school, and it's like, you know, it's really a kind of a ball buster, so to speak. But for me, it was like, I was looking forward to it being more like a vacation. And then he said, yeah, even though I've applied for these fellowships for you, though, you can work for anybody in the department. So you should interview the other faculty. It was a very small department. I remember one fellow there, uh, Robert Smith was uh, an analytical chemist that was going to analyze DDT residues and foods, I think. And the state of the art, he had, a, he had an HPLC column, which back then consisted of a helium tank hooked to a long stainless steel tube. And it was all very rudimentary. And I thought, eh, analytical chemistry was not my favorite subject. I mean, it was okay, but I didn't really want to do that. And then um, I talked to another professor named Charles Barfnick. And he had three graduate students, one who, who was working on identifying novel uh, contraceptive agents from plant materials, one who was making some new types of anti-inflammatories, and a third one who was making mescaline metabolites. And that attracted my attention because I knew that mescaline wasn't really metabolized and he hadn't published anything in this field, so I wasn't aware of any of his work. And so... Um, Alexander Sasha Shogun had just published a paper in 1969 called Structure Activity Relationships of One Ring Psychotomimetics. He'd summarized the work he'd done in about the previous probably five, six years, everything he'd done. And I knew everything that he was in that paper, sort of chapter and verse. And so <clears throat> when Professor Barfnack would mention something that Shogun had done, I, and I would basically finish his sentences. So uh, he very quickly realized that I knew quite about the quite a bit about the field. I had five and a half years of industrial experience working as a technician in the laboratory. And I had this fellowship which paid my tuition, paid me money for my research supplies, and also paid my mentor some money just for books and whatever. So he got really excited and said, yeah, you, you can work for me. So um, I worked for Charlie Barfnick and finished up my PhD in record time. I think I get 15 publications when I was a graduate student. He basically um, turned me loose in the lab. I knew more about the field than he did. And he just basically turned me loose in the lab. He'd come in on Monday morning. He was a big Green Bay Packers fan. And he would bring in a big cup of like, Green Bay Packers, cup of coffee and say, well, what's new in science and what do you, what's going on? And I'd tell him and the other students would tell him. And then he'd go back to his office and do paperwork and write lectures and so forth. So I just kind of did anything I wanted. I worked on several projects at the same time. 
I kept separate laboratory notebooks for each project. And um, in the summer of 72, I didn't realize I had a th the, this NDEA fellowship was a three-year fellowship. So it ran out in 1972. And I wasn't really aware of that. So he came in in 1972 after I'd only been in the program for three years and said, well, you need to write your thesis up. Well, nobody gets a PhD thesis in less, you know, three years. Well, Albert Hoffman did. He did just faster than that. But anyway, I was trying to make a compound that was a hybrid of a compound that they called STP and LSD. I was trying to put part, kind of the top part of LSD onto STP to make the hybrid molecule. And I hadn't been able to make it. I made some intermediates, but I, I asked him to let me keep working on this project. He said, okay. So then in the fall, um, my fellowship ended and I was a teaching assistant. So I had to run, they had a small NMR machine. So I ran NMR samples for people. And then he came in um, in the fall and said, you really need to write your thesis up. So uh, I said, well, I think I'm al I've almost got this compound. Let me give me a couple more weeks. And I had something that was crystalline and then I tried to recrystallize it and I could never get it back again. So I basically just kind of was stymied. And he came in and he said, okay, you didn't get the compound. You got plenty for your thesis, write up your thesis and, you know, get out and do something. So I wrote, it was the longest PhD thesis that anyone had ever written. And in the shortest length of time, um, I later talked to Joe Ken and he said he considered that I was one of the best graduate students they'd ever graduated. Which is, I just have a lot of experience. I just love being in the lab and doing lab work. So I defended my thesis in, I think, January of 73. And um, I, the department had uh, collaborations with J.P. Long, John Long, who was the head of the pharmacology department. And when I had a reaction that was running, I would go over and hang out in his lab and watch what he was doing. It was kind of a pharmacology groupie. So when, uh, I was writing my thesis and was, I was trying to think, what am I going to do now? It made sense to do a PhD, to do a postdoc in pharmacology to add to what I knew about the chemistry. <clears throat> and he had a master's student uh, named Jim who had been trying to get a series of simple compounds um, in mice looking at their set of effects. And one compound he hadn't been able to get, it was made by a student in uh, Professor Barfneck's group, who had been working on this, the so-called mescaline metabolites, and he hadn't been able to make it. And so, Jim, I asked Jim to test some of my compounds because I figured out how to make isomers of these hallucinogenic phenethylamines. He said, "Well, he said, you know, I'm really swamped. I could test your compounds, but I really, if I had this last compound, I could finish up my own thesis." He was writing a master's thesis. He said, but every time I get a sample of this stuff, it affects the mice differently. So I went back and talked to the student who'd been trying to make the compounds and realized he'd been really screwing it up um, and basically destroying the compound by the chemistry he was using. So I made a big batch of it, crystallized it. And they were, they looked like rock candy crystals, great big crystals. Put them in a little brown bottle. I think I had 15 or 20 grams. And back in those days, they didn't have word processors. They had on rub-on letters and structures. So you get these plastic sheets that were maybe four by six, and they had benzene rings printed on them and nitrogen and elements, et cetera. And you'd put it on a piece of white paper and rub on the back, and it would transfer off to the white paper. So we used those for drawing chemical structures before we had the software to do it. So I made a label for the bottle, and I, knowing how hard... Um, that it had been for a student to get the compound. I put a label on it. I put the structure, the name of the compound, and then at the bottom where it was the chemical company, I put Sheer Grace of God Chemical Company. So uh, I met him. I was actually going over to take it to his student, and I met him in the hall in the, in the pharmacology department. And I said, oh, JP, I think uh, Jim's been looking for this compound. I gave it to him. He read the label and just broke out in a horse laugh when he saw that sheer grace of God chemical coming because he knew he'd been really frustrated trying to get it. So I said, well, you know, I'm graduating from med chem. Do you think I could get a postdoc working in your lab? Oh, I think we can work something out. So I did a postdoc of almost two years in pharmacology with him. 
I wrote some software for analyzing pharmacological data, learned how to inject and handle rats, cats, uh, tissues, et cetera. So really, I'd been a pharmacology group kind of before that. So then I was officially in the pharmacology department. So then I filled out my training. So then when I was looking for a, a job, um, it happened that there was an opening at Purdue University that Professor Barknick had applied for, and they decided not to hire a senior person. They took a position. They had had a senior fellow who'd left and gone to Vanderbilt and who hadn't come back on from sabbatical. So they broke his position in two junior assistant professor positions. So I went to Purdue and gave a seminar and talked about chemistry and pharmacology and the whole bit. So I got that job there in 74. And uh, I just basically kept working on psychotomimetics because my professor, that wasn't a field he was really in before I got there and I had sort of created the field. In fact, he got promoted to associate professor based on mostly the work that I had done as a graduate student. All right. So I just kept on doing that for a couple of years until the department head, uh, Heinz Floss, saw me in hall one day. He said, you know, it's not cost effective for you to be working in the lab. You need to get a grant so you can get some hands working on your ideas. So then I got a grant and uh, that grant was funded for 29 years. I kept getting it renewed. So I was able to do that. And we did everything from synthesizing new molecules to testing them in a variety of different assays. Uh, we test them in cats, test them in mice and rats, smooth muscle assays, ended up using drug discrimination at the very end. And uh, then we got into molecular biology. I had stu students who were good at doing mutagenesis, so we mutated 5-HT2A receptors and tried to figure out how these drugs were binding. So it went the whole spectrum from just simple synthesis all the way up through molecular biology. Right. I mean, it really seems like when you describe the project in your PhD of trying to come up with this compound as a hybrid of LSD and STP, um, the ability to imagine that and then try to make it happen and, and invent or design a compound, I think to some people will seem like a kind of superpower, like this miraculous thing that you can do. And I think that's one of the things people might find incredible about kind of psychopharmacology and the chemistry behind it. Did you have a a sense of, was there something you were hoping this compound might, like certain properties it might have based on its structure? So the problem was, <clears throat> if you look at the structure of LSD and you look at the structure of something like mescaline, they don't look similar at all. And there were some attempts to rationalize what the receptor might look like. Um, Solomon Snyder, who's a very famous neuroscientist, in fact, the Solomon Snyder Laboratories at, I think, Johns Hopkins, um, he had proposed something that was published in a very prestigious journal, which was completely silly, where he showed mescaline as, as part of uh, whether or not mescaline could mimic LSD by binding hydrogen binding in two different ways. And chemically, it made no sense at all. And I knew he was a, he was a very world famous neuroscientist. And I saw that and I thought, how did this ever get published? So there were ideas of like, how something like mescaline or, or these compounds could change their shape to make them look like tryptamines and et cetera. And, and that just didn't make any sense to me at all. So I tried to envision how um, phenethylamines and LSD could bind to the same receptor. What did they have in common? And there were some people that thought that you could superimpose something like mes mescaline onto the A-ring of LSD, and, and that's the way it bound. And um, there just wasn't a very satisfactory explanation. So what I was doing was trying to do um, work with phenethylamines, which were far easier to synthesize than, than LSD or ergots. I was trying to make molecules that incorporated a phenethylamine structure within them, but that which also resembled LSD to a certain extent. So... STP or DOM has got an, an aromatic ring, two carbons away from the nitrogen, which is kind of like the bottom part of LSD. So then I was trying to put a, a reduced pyridine ring on top to see, okay, would that make it behave like LSD? So um, I never got that. The student who was my lab partner eventually made it and, it, and it actually didn't have very interesting properties. But I was trying to make trying to basically make structural analogs of phenethylamines that would look like 
uh, ergolines. And of course, now we have crystal structures of, of all these, so we kind of know how all of them bind. Um, and there really wasn't any similarity. It was one of these things where visually you inspect, you know, oh, this, this must be the way it works. But then when you actually do it, it that's not actually how they bind. Um, they, right. you know, LSD and phenethamines, they both have basic nitrogen binds to an aspartate and helix 3 of the receptor. But beyond that, they have different binding orientations. And so, but I made a lot of compounds <clears throat> and basically got a good feel for um, what made a compound active in, in our rat models, at least. And played right. around with uh, mostly phenethylamines and phenethyl phenethylamine analogs, rigid phenethylamine analogs, um, and made some ergolines. We, we made a whole library of LSD analogs that had, instead of diethyl amides, had other amides up there that you couldn't get. Um, we also changed the methyl on the basic nitrogen into a whole series of things, the ethyl, propyl. Some of those actually turned into recreational chemicals. Um, LSZ is one we made where we took the diethyl amide and tied it into a four-membered ring with two methyl groups on it. And that turned out to be useful in understanding the shape of the diethyl groups. So with LSD, if you change, it's a lysergic acid diethyl amide. If you change the diethyl amide to almost anything else, than anything we know of, the potency drops by about a factor of 10. And no one could really understand why that was because normally you'll see incremental changes in activity, you'll just see it all disappear completely. So then I had the idea that where the diethyl group bound must have been a very restricted stereochemically defined area in the receptor. So we made some amides that had stereochemical amines on them and showed that there was a difference in binding for those, even though they had the same number of carbon atoms. So then I, uh, we had made um, some dimethylazetidines, which is a four-membered ring but with ethyl groups, which are either on the same side or on opposite sides. So you have the cis, meso, RR, or SS. So we had three isomers that all had the same molecular weight. And we tested those and found that it was actually the SS diethyl, the SS dimethyl, which was the one that was most like LSD. We published that in 2002. And then in 2017, the lab where I'm um, hosted now, uh, published the crystal structure of LSD in the serotonin 2B receptor. And we could take that, the SS diethyl, dimethyl azenidine we made and superimpose it on the LSD that was in the crystal structure. So we had predicted 15 years earlier what the shape of those were. So it was kind of mostly scientific um, until I started the Hefter Institute in 93. And then we started trying to fund some clinical studies. Right. It might be worth for the audience just um, explaining the basics of receptor binding, like how it is the drugs act in the brain, because you're describing the kind of, you know, making hypotheses about the certain physical structure of these <clears throat> molecules and how they'll, they'll act. So it might just be worth mentioning something about that. Yeah. So uh, the target, the main target for the psychedelics is a serotonin receptor, where serotonin is a neurotransmitter. And it's called the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. So there's a 2A, 2B, 2C, and then there's a bunch of 5-HT1, et cetera. Anyway, it's a specific type of G-protein coupled receptor. And these G-protein coupled receptors are, are long proteins that weave back and forth through the neuronal membrane, sometimes called serpentine, because they'll go for in the top, out the bottom, in the bottom, out the top. And so they thread back and forth you have seven alpha helices packed together in a bundle. And uh, the LSD or the serotonin binds on the external in the external face of the receptor outside the neural membrane. And inside the membrane, the loops that connect the bottoms together, they couple to various types of signaling molecules, GTP binding proteins. That's why they're called G-protein coupled receptors. So when the ligand binds uh, to the exterior, toward the exterior part of the receptor, it changes the shape of the bundle, the way it packs together. And that changes the loops inside. And when their shape changes, they recruit the G alpha, these subunits and the rest, and they recruit it. And those are the things that actually produce the signals. 
So it's a way for a transmitter, a neurotransmitter, to send a signal inside the neuron membrane, inside the neuron, by changing the shape of this bundle of protein that's the receptor. So there's a binding site um, near the exterior surface called the orthosteric binding site. And that's where most of, most of these uh, uh, serotonin agonists bind. So uh, understanding what were the structural determinants, what amino acids were involved in inter interacting with those ligands. And that was the kind of thing we were trying to do when I was still at Purdue. Now the structural biology has gotten quite advanced now. There are just um, all the, I think, structures of all the receptors have been published. There's now a paper that's come out that tells exactly, you know, what the, how they bind to different types of G proteins, what the shape changes are. So that uh, molecular biology, structural biology, has become quite a complex and comprehensive field. Right. And there was this paper that came out a while ago with uh, the you worked on with uh, Brian Roth about the the structure of the serotonin two A receptor with LSD bound to it. Did that yeah. give you kind of insight into the kind of kinetics of LSD because it's it's much longer lasting rather than <clears throat> psychedelics? LSD is um, kind of an interesting molecule from a receptor binding kinetics point of view. When I was still at Purdue, we had done some. Um, simulated computational docking of LSD into a model receptor. And what we had noticed when we docked it the way we thought it probably bound was that the diethyl amide poked up toward the external surface of the receptor and interacted with a loop. So when the receptor threads in and out of the neuronal membrane, you have loops connecting on the bottom and loops connecting on the top. The loop that connects from the top of helix four, it goes over to the top of helix five, is kind of a lid over the receptor. And we had mutated all the residues in that loop because it looked like that was maybe interacting with the, the diethyl amide. And there was a leucine residue, leucine 229, that looked like it was very close. So we mutated all those and compared all of our azetidines and indeed, the SSZidide was closest to LSD. And when we mutated that leucine 229, it had the same kind of effect. So when we got to crystal structure, first of all, on the serotonin 2B receptor in 2017, and then in 2020, we did the structure of the 2A receptor. It turns out that this leucine 229, uh, after LSD binds, the extracellular loop two that goes over the top of the binding site, the leucine 229 pushes down into the binding site and wedges LSD in there. And there's a tryptophan that helps to wedge it. So uh, in the receptor kinetics that were done in that 2017 paper, we showed that it takes about three, to, if, you, if you take the recept, take a receptor preparation, uh, these are receptors that are expressed on um, HEK cells, human embryonic kidney cells. So it's an in vitro assay, but it's got the human receptor transfected into those. Um, if you incubate that receptor that's expressed in those cells with radioactive LSD and measure how much of it, what the kinetic rate is, it takes about at, at 37 Celsius, which is body temperature, it takes about three to four hours for the LSD to equilibrate. So that's pretty slow because usually transmitters just bang in and bang back out. And then more interestingly, if you now take that receptor that's been saturated with LSD, you take off the buffer with the tritiated radioactive LSD and put fresh buffer on it with no radioactive LSD. And then you take samples over time to see how much radioactivity is coming back out. Um, it takes about six to eight hours for LSD to completely come back out of the receptor. So that was kind of revealing because we thought, well, this maybe, maybe explains why LSD has such a long duration of effect. And also when LSD has been given intravenously in a, in a study where that was done, one of the subjects told me the weird thing was when they gave him the LSD, it still took like about 30 or 40 minutes for the effects to start. Mm 
typically, if you give an, an intravenous administration of you know methamphetamine, cocaine, you name it, it's pretty fast. It doesn't take 40 minutes. So that that kind of made me think, wow, that's kind of strange. It took so long to start. But when you think about it, it took three to four hours to equilibrate with the receptor. This lid sits on top of the binding site and just moves aside occasionally just through molecular motion. So the, the LSD molecules have to kind of sneak in, if you will. And then once they get inside, they have a lot of trouble getting back out. So we'd identified this leucine-229 um, in our earlier work when I was still at Purdue and uh, had shown that that was probably a residue that was important. Then when we saw the crystal structure, that 229 was most of the residues are projecting out toward the away from the surface of the neuron, but the 229 is actually folded down, wedging the LSD in there. <clears throat> so then they mutated that receptor, uh, humanized by changing, well, they took the 229 and mutated it to an alanine, which is a very small amino acid. And when they did that, the LSD got in very quickly and came back out very quickly. So we proved then following up that structural paper, we proved that that leucine 229 was a key determinant of locking the LSD in there. So, uh, <clears throat> so that kind of, I mean, <laughs> practically, I don't know what it's useful for. I mean, it's, it's science. It tells you it, LSD takes a long time to get in, takes a long time to get out. And that probably explains its long duration of action. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's that's good reason enough to do the research. It's fascinating to understand why the mechanism, you know, might be producing those effects. And um, you mentioned LSD earlier as kind of this analog of LSD. There's a whole kind of range of research chemicals produced of analogs of different psychoactive substances that sometimes are used to kind of get around the law, right? You make a new compound that has additional structure on it, um, but has basically the same effects. Could you explain kind of what it means for something to be an analog and what kinds of chemical differences there might be? So you can have all kinds of analogs. <clears throat> um, basically, you start with a structure. Say, say we start with mescaline. Mescaline is a 3,4,5-trimethoxyphenethylamine. So if you move one of those methoxies to another position, so now say it's a 2,4,5 instead of a 3,4,5, we call that a mescaline analog. Um, you might also replace one of the methoxies with an ethoxy. So we made some mescaline analogs where you have the three, four, five trimethoxy of mescaline. The four methoxy we changed to a four ethoxy, a four isopropoxy, a four alloxy. Sasha made some additional ones. So that position turns out to be critical. They're all mescaline analogs, but they have different properties, different potency, different duration of action, et cetera. Well, LSD, when we made, we took the methyl on the nitrogen and changed it to an ethyl and an allyl. And those have both been on the recreational drug market called Ethlad and, and Allad. Um, they're analogs of LSD. So essentially, they're minor modifications of LSD, but they have the basic core template of LSD. <clears throat> right. And it, it might be worth explaining the difference between tryptamines, phenethylamines, and ergolines that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, so um, the phenethylamines are an aromatic ring, a benzene, some people call it a benzene ring, with a two-carbon chain attached with a nitrogen now on the very end. So aromatic ring, CH2, CH2, NH2. Um, and you can decorate the side chain with an alpha methyl that gives you an amphetamine instead of a phenethylamine. Or if you put a methyl on the nitrogen, it would be a methamphetamine. The tryptamines are kind of the an indole analog. So instead of a benzene or phenyl ring, you have an indole ring, an indole system. An indole is a six-membered ring fused to a five-membered ring. And it's the basis, basic core of serotonin itself, essentially. And then at the what's called the three position you again have two carbons away from a basic nitrogen. <clears throat> this is a common theme, a common structural theme in lots of molecules that bind to monoamine neurotransmitter receptors. An aromatic system, two carbons away from a basic nitrogen. And the difference is what you have, what kind of decoration you have on the ring. So with tryptamines, if you have um, just tryptamine itself, it's not 
active. It doesn't have any psychoactive effects, so far as we know. If you put two methyl groups onto the basic nitrogen, you have NN dimethyltryptamine or DMT. Now that's a fairly potent psychedelic, but it's not active orally. You have to smoke it or insufflate it. Um, it's broken down by a, an enzyme in the liver called monoamine oxidase. Now, if you combine DMT with the monoamine oxidase, then it becomes orally active. And that's essentially what ayahuasca is. In ayahuasca, they take uh, plants called uh, Psychotria viridis or Chacruna. It, the leaves have DMT in them. And you pull off a bunch of those leaves. And then there's a vine, Banisteriopsis copy, which is a, a vine in the Amazonian uh, South America that produces what are called beta carbolines. And those inhibit monoamine oxidase. So if you take the bark of uh, Banisteriopsis and you break it and shred it, it's kind of a red colored wood, and you put it in a pot of water and you throw in a bunch of psychotric rhythm leaves and you boil them together, extracts out the DMT and extracts out the beta carbolines. You filter off the plant material, so you get this brown brew, brew that's called ayahuasca, and it's orally active. So it's, it's kind of similar to psilocybin in its effects, um, but it's essentially an orally active DMT preparation. Now, within the tryptamines, so with, within the phenethylamines, there are probably 200 that have been made between my lab and Sasha's, maybe 250 that have been investigated for activity. So that it's easy to modify those. The tryptamines, there's only a few that are really interesting. And basically they have either a four hydroxy in the four position or methoxy in the five position. And you can vary the substituents on the nitrogen. So if you have a four hydroxy dimethyltryptamine, that is a compound called psilocin. And if you put a phosphate group attached to the 4-hydroxy, you have a 4-phosphoryloxy, that's psilocybin. And that's a prodrug for psilocin. So when you take it orally, there are phosphatases in the gut that cut off this, the phosphate group and generate psilocin, which is the actual active species that activates the receptor. Um, it's broken, it's orally active, lasts four to six hours. Um, and um, we published some stuff on why we think it's orally active. We think something like bufotenin, which has a hydroxy in the five position, is not orally active. So psilocin has some special um, physical properties that make it orally active, but it lasts four to six hours. Um, if you take a compound like mescaline, it lasts about eight to 10 hours. Um, a lot of the phenethylamines are very long lasting. The tryptamines in general are shorter acting. Um, DMT, 15 to 20 minutes. 5-methoxy-DMT, which is the stuff that's commonly referred to as toad, it's produced by the parotid glands of uh, Bufo alvarius. So they, squirt, they squeeze the parotid glands on the side of the toad's head and it squirts out this milky toxin, which if a dog would bite that toad, and squirt this in his mouth, it's quite toxic and kill the dog. But if you spray this toxin out on a, to a mirror and let it dry, and then scrape it off with a razor blade, it has a lot of organic compounds that are burnt up if you pyrolyze it with a flame. So they put this toad extract into a pipe and then pyrolyze it, and only the 5 methoxy DMT vaporizes out, so it's, it doesn't kill you like the complete toxin would. And there's also synthetic 5 methoxy DMT. Um, People have called that the God molecule. In terms of its psychopharmacology, um, it's really powerful. It lasts 15 or 20 minutes. And most people who have done 5 methoxy dmt once, um, it's probably enough for them. A lot of people who've tried it say, yeah, that was crazy, but I don't want to do it again. Some people do it over and over, I guess. But um, So that's a really powerful tryptamine. So now if you go to LSD, LSD actually incorporates a tryptamine within its structure. So if you looked at LSD, you could see there's an indole nucleus at the bottom, runs away, there's a nitrogen, but then there's this whole ring system. So LSD is a large flat molecule, relatively planar molecule, that's made of four rings fused together. 
It's semi-synthetic. There are some synthesis, total synthesis procedures, but there it's like the Mount Everest for organic chemists. Uh, there are multiple steps, and the final yields are like you know, very low percentage yields. The way it's mostly been obtained is by, in the early days, by taking fields that were contaminated with ergot fungus and then separating the ergot from the wheat. Um, then uh, when commercial production really began, probably in the 50s, um, they started using submerged fermentation. So they'd take big tanks full of um, different nutrients, inoculate it with the claviceps fungus, and it would grow the fungus in a big batch of broth. And then they would filter out and collect the ergot alkaloids out of that. So their ergot alkaloids have been known since the Middle Ages. There were scourges called St. Anthony's fire from people who would eat bread that was made with ergot contaminated grain. And the thing about ergot alkaloids is they cause severe vasoconstriction, constriction of the blood vessels, especially in your fingers and toes. So when you eat it, eat this bread repeatedly, so that there would be, a, say there would be a cold, moist fall when they harvested the grain, and would be, that would be conducive to the growth of ergot on, on rye that they used to make bread. <clears throat> They'd make bread out of it without paying any attention to what was in there. And then people would start eating this and they would get what's called St. Anthony's fire. Um, when your peripheral vasculature contracts, your fingers and toes, when the blood vessels contract and stay contracted, basically they're deprived of oxygen and nutrients. And so they become necrotic. They get black and they are extremely painful, a burning sensation. And then if you keep doing it, what happens when you'd have those people that had ergotism, you'd see people that were missing fingers and toes if they, if they recovered. It killed about 40,000 people in the Middle Ages because it's very toxic. But if you survived, if you're, and your fingers looked like if you had this necrosis, your fingers would look like they were burned. They would just be like black, like they were burned. And St. Anthony was patron saint of ergot uh, victims. Anyway, but you can take ergot alkaloids and you can cook them up in lye, essentially. And it'll take off the top piece of this and it'll reveal lysergic acid. So you have lysergic acid coupled to different things. You treat it with sodium hydroxide, it, it will cut off those other things and leave you lysergic acid. And that's easily coupled with diethylamine to make LSD. So in that case, um, and of course the dose of LSD varies from probably 50 or 60 micrograms up to maybe two or 300, depending on how brave you are. Um, and so that uh, has been the most commonly used one because it's so potent. Imagine if you had a gram of LSD, um, you'd have quite a few doses. So 10,000 doses per, I think 10,000 doses per gram. And so if you could get a gram of lysergic acid or some, some, some way get a hold of it, um, you wouldn't have to make a lot. And if you want to make money, then you'd 10,000 doses at $5 a dose or whatever, you'd have $50,000. So it was very lucrative for the underground chemist if they could do it without getting caught. Right. And I mean, when uh, Albert Hoffman first discovered LSD, right, when he first tested on himself, he took a quarter of a, a milligram, right, which he right. thought was a a minuscule amount, but actually we now know 250 micrograms is quite a hefty dose. Yeah, and he took it, well, that was, you know, bicycle day is April the 19th. That's the, on this Friday the 16th, he was working in the lab and I, sp I spoke with him personally. He came from Purdue and gave a talk and I got a chance to speak with him. And uh, I said, you know, where'd this idea come from? He said, well, you know, I was just eating my lunch in the lab and even told me what he was eating. So I think it was like a cucumber and mayonnaise sandwich or something like that. And he said, I just had this idea, this feeling that the lab, the pharmacology lab had missed something with it. And it was LSD 25, it was the 25th in the series. I don't know how many he made, probably 60 or 70 different ones. So it was the 25th in the series. They tested them all. And uh, they reported back that the 25th caused a little stimulation in mice, but they weren't really interested in whatever it did. So that was in 1938. So in 1943, he's eating this cucumber sandwich for lunch, and he's going, 
I just had this feeling that they must have missed something with the 25th in the series. Now, why the 25th? He doesn't know. He just said it was just a feeling he had. So he decided to make some more. Now, you know, if you work in industry and you send compounds down to the pharmacology department to test them, and they say, you know, this is not an interesting compound. If you come back five years later and say, I made some more of this because I think you screwed up the first assay, uh, that doesn't go over real well. And so, um, and he, he mentioned that, you know, he knew that, you know, this would be a kind of a problem if he made it, but he, he wanted to have it tested again. So he made another sample. <clears throat> Nobody knows how he got into his body. Um, he says he used dichloromethane, and you have to do column chromatography to get it really pure. It's possible he get, and back in those days, they didn't wear gloves in the lab. Now they all wear vinyl gloves and eye protection and everything. But in those days, they didn't. They were just kind of careful. And not realizing that this was such a potent compound, he probably was a little bit careless. Maybe he's running the column and he's taking a sample and some of the dichromethane solution gets on his hand while he's collecting samples. That's possible. And it's a free base and it's fairly lipid soluble, so it would be absorbed into his body. The weird thing is, if you read the description of that first uh, experience, it lasted only two to three hours, but it sounds like it was, you know, like 100 micrograms or so. And um, I gave a talk years ago where the audience, maybe 300 people, was an audience of experienced what we'll call psychonauts. I said, now I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to keep your hands up until you disagree with what I'm saying. And Albert Hoffman's first uh, accidental ingestion of LSD, he must have ingested at least 100 micrograms and all the hands go up. From, and I read the description that he said, kaleidoscopic visions, da, da, da. And I said, and how many people think it was like 150? And a couple of hands went down, 200, a few more hands went down. But by and large, everyone thought that he'd ingested at, at least 100 micrograms of LSD. And then I end up, and then I read the last part of his description. After about two to three hours, the effects subsided. And everybody's going, LSD lasts longer than two to three hours. So it's kind of a conundrum how that actually happened. But maybe he was uniquely sensitive. I don't know. That was Friday. So Monday the 19th, which they call Bicycle Day, is when he did the experiment where he made up a solution and took 250 micrograms, a fourth of a milligram. And then when it kicked in, um, he took his bicycle, rode his bicycle back home, he got his lab assistant. They were having gas rationing during the war, and so people were riding bicycles. So he felt like he was riding really slow, but his lab assistant later told him, you were really, really going at a fast pace. Got home and had him, his wife had gone to visit some relatives, so he had his, uh, his lab assistant call for a doctor. The doctor came and examined him, his vitals were all good. Said, well, you know, I don't, everything seems fine. But that was the first big experience where he really was overwhelmed. So then he went back and told the people at Sandoz. And of course, there was no morality about doing something like that back then, like there was after the road war started. You know, what you took it and this happened. Nobody looked at him and said, no, you're stupid for doing that. They didn't believe him. They said, no, 250 micrograms, no way. So then several people in the company decided to see if it was that active. And they took 80 micrograms, which, of course, convinced them all that he was right. So that was Bicycle Day, mm -hmm. April the 19th, which they celebrate now some places right. you know, every year. And there's, there's also this idea that um, in talking about ergot that in, in the past, perhaps with the, the ancient Greeks and the Eleusinian mysteries, that they knew how to take ergot infested bread and treat it in such a way to make it into a kind of LSD-like potion with at least some kind of psychoactive uh, ergolines, ergot molecules in it. Do you think it's possible with basic kind of primitive uh, technologies of brewing up potions that, that something like this could have, could have been possible? You know, that's a big question. What the Eleusinian mysteries were, a lot of people have thought because barley was one of the components of Kaikion, that maybe it was infested with argot. 
there there perhaps could have been you know it the ergot alkaloids that are produced by the ergot fungus are different depending on what's claviceps purpurea claviceps paspali there's some other claviceps that infect grasses i mean it's conceivable that there was an ergot fungus that actually produced something that produced hallucinations by itself no one's been able to track that back uh, peter webster had a theory years ago that uh, maybe there was some some chemical procedure i think i talked with him i communicated with him about that i said you know it's possible that you could um, boil it up with uh, something like acetic acid or which would which would come from wine that had been fermented and then had oxidized maybe you could do that and, and hydrolyze it and get some kind of a lysergamide um, but it's kind of speculative um, I think they don't believe that it was a psilocybin mushroom um, but there was some psychoactive material there now whether it was er an ergot or some derivative of ergot you could you could do some crude chemistry for example if you take wood ashes and leach them with water, you'll get potassium hydroxide. So con conceivably, maybe they, were, they had a technique for doing a partial hydrolysis, taking wood ashes, leaching out the water, then treating ergot alkaloids and getting a partial hydrolysis. And then you can neutralize that back with um, acetic acid, old, old wine that had gone bad. You, you could do some basic chemistry like that. It was all basically hidden. So it's hard to know because um, in Greek and Roman times, when they talked about wine, they weren't talking about the kind of wine that we have today because wines were spiked with all kinds of things. And sometimes people would say, well, I'm going to have a big party and I'm going to make some wine up and all. And sometimes the wine would kill people because they put things in there that were so toxic. So it's, it's really hard to know. But when you think of something that uh, lasted for 2,000 years, in you know, in the earliest really advanced civilization, um, and was so so carefully the secret was so carefully guarded that you know, if you talked about it, you could be put to death. Um, it really sounds like it was a really powerful ceremony of some kind. They had uh, all night uh, attendance uh, in the special building called the Tel Telstrion. So. It was something powerful. We believe it was a psychedelic of some kind, but it still remains a mystery to me. I haven't seen anything that really convinced me as to why. Right. I mean, the in recent years, there was uh, Brian Murescu's book, The Immortality Key, that came out a few years ago, where he cites some evidence that had just kind of gone under the radar, I think written in Catalan, from some academics who'd found a, a, a Greek site in on the kind of east coast of Spain, but it was a Greek culture. Uh, where they had cups, kicking on cups that had traces of ergot in it, which was seemed like an amazing kind of smoking gun because until that point, it had been pure speculation. You know, the descriptions of the experiences sound psychedelic. It's a harvest festival, so grain is being harvested. We know it's a beer, you know, I think he argues it's kind of more of a barley-based wine beer rather than how we think of grape wine. So there's really, an, yeah, definitely interesting picture emerging there but uh, unfortunately as you say it's probably hard to really know for certain yeah i'm surprised in fact i'm surprised ergonocloids would last um, mm. you know there's a there are um, samples of peyote cactus that are i think 5700 5700 years old that they found in a burial site in the american southwest and phenethylamines are pretty stable but lsd i mean it, it goes bad really quickly if you take a vial, you take LSD in a solution in water and put it in a sunny window, it's all been destroyed in, an hour, in one hour. Okay. So the light and air are so powerfully destructive to something like LSD. But it's conceivable, you know, if, if they were kept dark and kind of in a place that didn't have any air, yeah, maybe there could be some traces of ergots in there. But I don't think you, you, you might be able to do a test of, that would say, well, this was an ergot, but I don't think you'd find enough to be able to analyze and find out what it was. Right. But, you know, it wouldn't be surprising if it was an ergot, you know, that if if they had um, ergot grows in the fields, and you, you can see their big dark grains that they're different. 
you could in the threshing you could probably separate the ergot from just the regular grains if you wanted to and maybe do some simple chemistry but again there may have been a strain of claviceps that produced more hallucinogenic alkaloids right and so to switch gear to the um the, the whole kind of psychedelic renaissance in research that's been happening over the previous decades you've you've played a really kind of important role in multiple ways there and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think I've seen you in an interview mentioning that you made the DMT for Rick Strassman's famous study, which was the kind of first psychedelic study in a generation. Also, the psilocybin for Roland Griffiths end of life study, the 2006 right. paper that really kind of kicked off the modern stuff. And then um, also the MDMA for Rick Doblin and, and MAPS. And it's, it's, I mean, I guess it makes sense, you know, to, I think a lot of people wouldn't ask the question, you know, uh, where do people get these substances from? Because as soon as you think about it, it's obvious you can't just buy it off the shelf in some supermarket, no, right? Um, but yeah, so was this just through different collaborations, through talking to these people that you became involved in these projects? Yeah, so I, I met, well, I met Rick Doblin and Rick Strassman at a conference at Esalen, where they had a bunch of people there that were talking about psychedelics. And eventually there was a second one in the spring where they were trying to strategize how to keep MDMA from being made illegal. But I was the only kind of legitimate medicinal chemist that was there. They were mostly like West Coast um, therapists and uh, counselors and people like that. So um, Rick Doblin contacted me in 85, shortly after um, the meeting where I met him and said, you know, I can't find anybody who's going to make MDMA. Could you make it? And I said, well, I've never done anything like that before in like large scale. And he put me in touch with a chemist at the Food and Drug Administration. And I talked to the chemist. It was a woman. She said, well, here's what you need to do. You know, we need your CV. We need a description of the lab. Blah, 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 blah. All the paperwork and certifications. And um, the method has to be, you know, where did you get the starting material? What's the batch number? How did you do the analysis? Blah, blah, blah. So it was something a chemist could do. So, um, we made 1.4, I think 1.4 kilograms of really high purity MDMA, 99.86% or something, I don't know. Anyway, and I put them in brown bottles of 250 grams each, uh, put them nitrogen in the bottle and then dipped them in paraffin to seal them. I put all these bottles, so I had like four or five, five of them in my safe and then another one which was a partial bottle. I sent him the first 250 grams and he needed to do preclinical toxicology. So I sent the first bottle and he said, oh, that's more than enough. Yeah, we don't need any more. So then I still had, you know, more than a kilogram of MDMA in the safe. So then I, um, people found out that I was the one that had it. So then I donated a lot of it to people who were doing the early, the early research. And couldn't get MDMA because NIDA wasn't supplying at that point in time. So I donated to a lot of people. And then I met Rick Strassman at the same meeting, and he was a psychiatrist. And we both were moaning, bemoaning the fact that there was no one doing clinical studies. I said, well, Rick, you're a psychiatrist. You're, a, you're in a, an academic position. You could do a study if you wanted to. And so we had several meetings. We met with Danny Friedman, who is the acting head of of uh, uh, psychiatry at UCLA, had a couple of meetings with Danny Friedman. Then he strategized. He had a, a Rick Strassman had a new department head, I think, named Ullenhuth, who was really good at designing clinical trials. So he started working toward doing that and getting, he got some money from uh, uh, Danny Friedman, recommended his study to somebody and that, that gave him a little bit of money. And then he said to me, <clears throat> Well, he said, what if I get everything, all the approvals, and then nobody will make the DMT? I said, well, I just made this big batch of MDMA. I could do it because DMT is a simple synthesis. So that's what happened. He got to the end. He said, yeah, nobody wants to make DMT for humans. So then I made that for him. And then we started. He had a grant. I had. He's putting a grant. He wanted to work on psilocybin. And I started working on the synthesis of psilocybin. But the way Hoffman had made it, he used a Albert Hoffman had used a reagent that was very dangerous. When it was when it was uh, undiluted, it was 
known to spontaneously detonate. So my technician said, you know, I'm not going to work with that reagent. So I said, oh, yeah, I, yeah, we're not doing that. I don't want something to blow something to land. So we spent a lot of time. Actually, Rick Strassman got really pissed off at me because we didn't deliver. And, you know, if you have a contract, um, you, you say, okay, this is the delivery date. A research grant is not like that. A research grant is we're proposing to do something. This is what we hope and think will happen, but it won't necessarily work the way that we thought. So he, I got a small grant as a co-investigator on his study, and we were going to try to make psilocybin. And we discovered that this was problematic. So we spent a long time finding a way to put the phosphate on to make psilocybin. Rick wrote a bunch of nasty letters to people at NIH saying I should never get another grant that I had lied and all this stuff. And that kind of ruptured our friendship at that point. But I never could make the psilocybin in time. And then he 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 and his wife broke up and he moved to Canada and everything kind of fell apart. So, but then after we'd done that work, then um, Roland Griffiths came to me and said, "Can you guys make psilocybin?" Bob Jesse wants to get some psilocybin. Bob Jesse was funding his uh, first study in Healthies. That's the one he published in 2006. And I said, yeah. I said, we've just spent three or four years working part-time trying to figure out the best way to make it. And now we can make some for you. So we made, I think, four grams the first time. Then we improved the synthesis even more and made them 20 grams for all the big studies that they did of end of life patients. So that was kind of how that went down. And uh, I felt really looking at the time, I just thought, you know, this isn't going anywhere. I'm just helping these people out. But in retrospect, looking back, I was at a meeting in uh, the Czech Republic in Prague a couple of years ago. And at the end, they had a Q&A and I was there with Bill Richards and Amanda Fielding and um, some other people. And we were supposed to talk about what we learned at the meeting. And I told... Rita, the woman who organized us, said, well, I didn't learn anything at the meeting. I was just hanging out with interesting people. Can we just talk? So yeah, just say whatever you want. And so I got up and I told the people there, I said, you all are really lucky to, that you're here. Because I said, um, this field has had more obstacles than you even realize. And I said, Rick Doblin, um, we made his MDMA for him. And it cost him $4,000, which is just the cost of materials. We did it gratis, my graduate students and I. And I said, had he not been able to do that, he probably wouldn't be doing any of these clinical studies. And so this meeting wouldn't be happening. And I said, I did it for $4,000. And I just talked to Rick and he said, when he bought the GMP grade MDMA that he needed for the phase three studies, it cost him $400,000. So I said, you know, my contribution was kind of enabling these things when nobody else would do it. But I never imagined, um, looking back, that um, that would those studies would have been uh, so pivotal in, in right. way. And of course, we started the Hefter Research Institute in '93, and our goal uh, was to um, to promote and encourage and fund where we could studies of psychedelics and we had some pretty big name people said don't call them psychedelics they're hallucinogens i said no no we're going to call them psychedelics and we kept that in our mission statement and uh, it wasn't really politically correct to call them psychedelics in scientific literature until you know 2015 or so 2016 i wrote a review article on them in 2004 that came out called the title was Hallucinogens. Then I was asked to write another review a couple of years later that came out in 2016. And then I was asked by the associate editor to write a, a, a review on psychedelics. I said, yes, I've been invited. <laughs> it taken off and, and Hefter Institute made a, a big push to call everything we were doing psychedelics. So now I think almost everybody calls them psychedelics. A few. You know, government officials still call them hallucinogens, and there's still some kind of right-wing people, but they're really, they don't produce hallucinations. It's just not a good name for them. Yeah. So we did that. And um, 
Also funding the first clinical studies. I mean, we had a lot of trouble getting money for that. We had a real estate guy early on who gave us, I think, $10,000. I saw his wife a few years ago. And I said, you remember giving us that $10,000? She said, oh, yeah. And I, I said, and when you gave us that money, you said, no one can ever know where this money came from. So it was like, had to really be secret. So things have changed a lot since 1990. Right. And wasn't there a time when you were the only person who was legally allowed to, to make LSD? Um, I was the only academic who was making it because we, well, NIDA didn't have enough. Um, they had small samples, but, you know, they give you a milligram or two milligrams that we were using. We had a colony of rats trained to LSD, usually 14 or 15 rats, and they'd get an injection of LSD like every other day continuously. So, we were going through 150 milligrams of LSD. I don't remember the exact figure, but some number like that per year. In fact, the, the last time I had an inspection by the DEA at Purdue, he came in, pulled all my samples out, and he held up this little vial and he said, LSD, is that really LSD in there? I said, yeah. And he dropped it like it was a hot potato. He said, are you allowed to make that? I said, yeah, we use it for our research. But are you authorized to make LSD? <laughs> Yeah, we used for our research. So he was kind of surprised. A lot of people just like freak out about, it. you know, and Hoffman, well, we made LSD in the lab lots of times and we'd purify it. And you can see LSD, it fluoresces, a really blur it, bright blue color. So we'd go through and turn all the lights out and use a UV lamp and shine it to see where we'd spilled it so we could clean it up. And my students were, and I was never particularly careful we didn't wear gloves back in these days i mean almost nobody did so nobody ever that was working with it my lab and including me nobody ever got intoxicated just routinely so it's kind of weird that albert hoffman right you know, who's a meticulous chemist ended up getting it in his body that first time but yeah so to end on how does it how does it feel now after work, having such a you know multi-decade career working in this stuff when it was really a, a niche thing for it to be hitting the mainstream now? Um, you know, I think in this life, one of the most important things you can do maybe is leave something behind when you're gone. And a woman asked me years ago, she said, so where do you see the field going? And this was probably in, 2015 or earlier before things really took off where do you see things going and I said you know someday probably long after I'm dead um, people will be having someone will be having a midlife crisis and you go down to the corner and see your shaman slash psychiatrist and he'll give you a session with a psychedelic and you'll get a new perspective and you'll get the problem solved she thought oh my god you think you'll be dead before that happens I said probably but I said, you know, if the vector's pointing in the right direction, that'll be okay. So I never, never could have predicted this. I don't think anybody could have predicted how fast this would have taken off. But looking back, the fact that, you know, I kept the sort of the torch going when no one else was really doing any and enabled, you know, Maps and Strassman and Johns Hopkins to get their studies because nobody else would make the drug for them. Um, it's satisfying. Um, when I gave that talk in Prague, um, what's his name? The guy, um, Acid Dreams. Um, I'll get this book here. Martin Lee was in the audience. <clears throat> he came up to me after he said, I had no idea you made all those drugs for these people. I said, no, that was me. So, yeah, I've been kind of flown under the radar. In fact, at Purdue. <clears throat> of course, the department and my and my colleagues knew what I was doing. I had the psych the grant for psychedelics. I had a grant for dopamine agonists, and for about twelve years or so, I had grants to study MDMA and its mechanism of action, but never really advertised it that much. And Purdue didn't really care as long as you brought in money and supported students, and they got their indirect costs. They were happy, so I did what they expected me to do, and no one really thought about it. Nichols is making psychedelics. Isn't that kind of weird? And Nobody really did. But a lot of places, um, if you wanted to get a seminar about psychedelics, at least the chemistry and pharmacology, I was the only one you could get for many, many years. And I'd go get 
a medical school and the auditorium would be packed. And they'd say, wow, we've never had a crowd this big for a seminar before because there was so much interest in psychedelics and so little information. Hello. Yeah, so I'm I'm really pleased. I was 20 years younger, so I could be more of a participant in what's going on. Yeah, well, I really appreciate what you've contributed uh, so far and for your time today. Thank you. Yeah, um, my pleasure. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.